Hello and welcome to our lecture on reconstruction. Um, we're going to take a look at this time period, really some of the successes and failures of the time period of reconstruction, which is the rebuilding after the American Civil War. So the American Civil War took place in the 1860s and this is the time period after that. All right, so some of the basics as we talk about reconstruction, we can have some similar um, understanding of the word. Um, the when reconstruction happened, as I mentioned, was immediately after the Civil War from 1865 and it ended in 1877. Now the what of reconstruction. Um, the question was really how do we rebuild the country after the Civil War. If you remember the Civil War, the United States was split into two countries, the North or the Union, um, the United States of America, and then the South or the Confederacy. They really considered themselves a separate country, the Confederate States of America. Those yellow um, states that you see here where my cursor is, those we refer to as the border states. And they ultimately, they were slave states that stayed loyal to the Union. However, when the war ended, the Union or the North had won, and the question was, what do we do now? How do we rebuild these states that were just devastated and destroyed by war? And then also, the second question, what do we do to allow these states that had seceded, these states that had rebelled, these states that had left, how do we allow them back into the Union or into the United States again? As you can imagine, there was definitely a lot of conflict. Abraham Lincoln, who was president during the war, thought one thing. He was ultimately assassinated. Andrew Johnson, his vice president, took over. Um, he had a different idea of what Reconstruction should look like. And then many members of Congress also had different ideas. Even within Congress, there was a lot of conflict about what it should look like. Congress at this time was controlled by the Republican political party. Both Lincoln and Johnson were Republicans. Um, in the South at this time, most of the Southern leaders were Democrats. And the Democrats really were those who favored states' rights and were had favored um, the Confederacy. So there's conflict between all of these. Ultimately what happens um, was the Recon Congress passes the Reconstruction Act of 1867. This law or this act divided those Southern states that you see at the, highlighted on your screen into five military districts. Each of those districts was overseen by Union or Northern military commanders, and they really were there to make sure that the Southern states were following the new laws that the Republican Congress was passing after the Civil War, and that things were going according to what Congress wanted them to do. All right, so now that we kind of have a super basic understanding of what we mean when we say Reconstruction, this time period after the Civil War, let's take a look at some of the successes. What were some of the positive outcomes of this time period? The first thing are what we refer to as the Civil War Amendments. So these are actually um, changes to the United States, the federal constitution, and the amendments really um, kind of lay out the rights of people in the U.S. So the first one is the 13th Amendment. Most people refer to this as the end of slavery or abolishing slavery. Um, it, end, it ultimately ends the institution of slavery as we know it. However, if you read the wording, it's a little bit tricky. It's here on your screen. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So yeah, it ends slavery or involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime if somebody's been convicted. So if you go to court and you've been convicted of a crime, you can, according to the Constitution, still be considered a slave or have involuntary servitude. And so this comes to play out as we'll look at for a lot of the rest of the semester in many ways. The next amendment that was passed was the 14th Amendment. And while the 14th Amendment ultimately has a lot of sections to it, the two pieces that I want you to know about the 14th Amendment are pictured here and listed at the bottom of your slide in the key terms or ideas. First is what we refer to as birthright citizenship. This says that all people born in the United States are citizens of the United States. This was ultimately done in a question of what do we do with all, these, all of these formerly enslaved people. They've all been freed, and now what? 
are they citizens or are they not? The Constitution said that two fifths that slaves only count as two fifths of a person. However, now what do we do? Slavery has been ended, and so um, the Fourteenth Amendment ultimately establishes the idea and the right that these formerly enslaved people, these freed people, are citizens of the United States. The second part is what we call the Equal Protection Clause. It says that all people are equal under the law. The law should not treat people differently. The law should be applied to all people the same. All people are equal under the law. And this piece of the 14th Amendment is really, really important and will really come into play as we continue the semester. And the final Civil War Amendment that's it's passed during this time is the 15th Amendment. This is often referred to as universal male suffrage. This word suffrage is a really tricky word. Um, suffrage ultimately means the right to vote. So universal male suffrage means that all men are able to vote. It says the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So you can't be denied the right to vote based on your race, your skin color, or the fact that you may have once been enslaved. All right, so another success of the um, this time period of the Reconstruction era is what we call the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was established by Congress at the end of the Civil War in 1865 to deal with refugees, freedmen, and abandoned land. There's a lot of land that was either confiscated, was taken away from many of the Southern leaders or the Democratic leaders of the South or leaders of the Confederacy, um, as well as land that was just abandoned during the war. And so the question was, what do we do with this? And what do we do with all these people who were formerly enslaved who are now free? So what they did, and here's some pictures, they gave food and medicine, they gave aid to those who needed it. The Fre Freedmen's Bureau set up schools for former slaves. They even established colleges that are still around today, Fisk University in Tennessee or Howard University in Washington, D.C., two of the most well-known HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, still around today. They built hospitals and dealt with labor disputes between blacks and whites. They legalized marriages of formerly enslaved people, and they helped uh, formerly enslaved people find their long lost relatives. They also really wanted to give that abandoned and confiscated land to the formerly enslaved people. However, as um, the Freedmen's Bureau kind of lost power as Reconstruction went on, and those Democrats who owned all that land started to gain power, the further we got away from the Civil War, uh, most of that land ended up being restored to the original owners. Ultimately, the Freedmen's Bureau was dismantled in 1872. So while there were some schools established and hospitals established, ultimately it really did not lead to a lot of lasting change. Another success that needs to be noted during um, Reconstruction era was that many black men were elected into uh, political positions during this time. Around 2,000 black men were elected into local, state, and even federal offices during Reconstruction. The man pictured in the middle here is Pinckney B.S. Pinchback. Um, he was elected uh, or appointed really as the governor of Louisiana, and he served as governor for a year. The next state governor would not be in for over a hundred years until 1989. We had the next black governor in Virginia. Hiram Revels is also pictured here. Um, he is the first black senator. He's the first black man elected into the U.S. Senate. He was also followed five years later by Blanche Bruce of Mississippi. Um, these men served in Senate for short periods of time. However, it's important to note that they were actually elected into the Senate because we won't see another black man elected until Edward Brooke from Massachusetts in 1967. A hundred years later, nearly, Hiram Revels was appointed in 1870, so a hundred years later. To date, we still only have 10 African Americans who have ever served in the Senate, and only two of them have been women. Side note here, a lot of people think California is so forward thinking. California didn't have their first black senator until 2017 when we elected Kamala Harris to the Senate. <laughs> 
Ultimately, just like we saw with the Freedmen's Bureau, as those Democrats began to uh, reestablish their power, most of these men lost their offices within a few years due to intimidation, death, and state voting restrictions that really removed any of the power that these Black men had seen during Reconstruction. So while I mentioned some of the successes, it's also really important that I mention the failures. One of the reasons why the Freedmen's Bureau failed, one of the reasons why we didn't see long lasting political change for black men in the South after the Civil War was because of the organized racism that was that began in the South. The Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, the Klan or the KKK was founded in 1865. This group of people, this was an organized way to fight against Reconstruction, to restore white supremacy is ultimately what they were doing. They, were, they called it though the Southern way of life, right? They were often seen as saviors of the South. In the Klan often included law enforcement officials, or if law enforcement, enforcement officials were not officially part of the Klan, they often wouldn't actually do anything to stop Klan activity. Um, the Klan would use intimidation tactics. You can see up here in the right-hand corner, um, one of the most famous things they're known for is burning crosses in front of houses. Um, they would do this in, in front of houses where um, Black people who tried to vote would lived. This was used as a warning that if, if you had a burning cross in your church or in your front yard, you knew that the next step was violence. Um, Blacks also could get fired from their jobs if they were caught voting. And then the Klan ultimately resorted to violence as well. Between 1867 and 1868, the Klan killed seven men who were elected to legislative positions throughout the South. So seven men who had been elected by their communities were killed by members of the Klan who did not um, see punishment as a result of their crimes. In South Carolina in 1871, 500 Klan members attacked a county jail and lynched eight black prisoners during this time. And so we see kind of this organized violent racism that gets rooted in the South as a direct result of the prog progress from Reconstruction. Another um, failure of Reconstruction were the establishment of Black codes. Now, the Black codes are often referred to as the Jim Crow laws. These were really a way to regulate freed slaves and establish, again, white supremacy throughout the South and really throughout the country. Um, they focused on, they were state laws focusing on restricting social, economic, and political freedoms. So some of the ways that they limited um, social freedoms or they established so, so, social restrictions was by making it illegal for um, white and black people to get married. Here in this picture, this is um, what's a very famous court case called Loving v. Virginia. This is the first legally married um, black and white couple in the United States. This was not legally, they were not legally married until 1967 through the Supreme Court when they made a um, deci decision that got rid of the anti-miscegenation laws or those marriage laws between blacks and whites. Um, other laws that we see um, that were limiting the um, social freedoms of black people after the Civil War, um, blacks weren't allowed to assemble or come together without a white person present. Blacks weren't allowed to own guns. Again, all of this in an attempt to control the black community. Some of the economic restrictions, um, one of the more famous things in many states, they had what were called vagrancy laws. So um, people without jobs could ultimately be arrested and the sheriff could then hire the prisoners out to landowners for labor. The courts usually waived these punishments if they were white vagrants. Vagrants are people kind of wandering about, right? People without jobs. And so we see that this is limiting the economic restrictions, I'm sorry, limiting the economic freedoms of these formerly enslaved people. They don't even have the option to be unemployed, even if they wanted to or had the means to be. And this is another way that those white landowners were able to get their labor force back. Another thing that we see in South Carolina were, were, were what we call labor contracts, where it was actually a written contract between a servant and a master. The servant lived and worked on the master's land. They could work from sunup to sundown. The master had the right to moderately whip a servant over 18 for discipline. 
If the servant was sick, their time was deducted from their wages. And if the servant left before their contract was up, the wages had to be returned to the master. Another thing we see in South Carolina as well is blacks weren't allowed to have any occupations other than a farmer or a servant under contract without an annual license from a judge. And you can imagine how many judges were willing to give out those annual licenses. So again, we see the restrictions placed on the black community throughout the South in order to limit their economic freedoms, the jobs they were allowed to have access to, and also providing labor for the white people who the white plantation owners or just the white landowners who needed the help. We also see limits on political restrictions or limits on, I'm sorry, limits on political freedoms or political restrictions. Um, blacks weren't allowed to serve on juries. Blacks weren't allowed to testify against whites, even if a white person had committed a crime against them. So never were they able to actually speak out or ever accuse a white person of committing a crime against them. We also saw voting restrictions during this time um, that were passed Again, state laws passed. So number one, literacy tests. Um, these were tests you had to take to prove whether you could read or write. Well, many of these formerly enslaved people were uneducated. And even after for 10, 15, 20 years after the war, um, and even after reconstruction ends, a lot of these formerly enslaved or their descendants are working so much, they don't have time to get an, to get an education. Or if they do, it's not, as good as other education for white children. And so many of them can't pass the literacy test. Plus, even if they can, the test is graded by the person who's giving, like the person who hands you the test and it's at their discretion. So they can ultimately say that uh, um, one of the questions is wrong if they want to. Another um, political restriction or voting restriction in this case is what we call a poll tax, right? So you actually have to pay to vote. Um, and many of the formerly enslaved and many black people as we continue were too poor to be able to afford the poll tax. And then finally, they have what was called the grandfather clause, because the reality was many poor white people couldn't read and many poor white people couldn't afford the poll tax. So the grandfather clause was a way to recapture that white vote. It said, if you, you can vote if you or your descendant voted in 1867, right? So you or your grandfather voted in 1867. Well, blacks weren't able to vote in 1867. So this was a way that would allow white people, they could, if they couldn't pass a literacy test or couldn't, pass, couldn't pay a poll tax, they would still be allowed to vote. All right, so that was, a the oops, I'm sorry, one of the failures of Reconstruction. Um, the next failure of Reconstruction is ultimately the end of Reconstruction. Um, and so we have Reconstruction um, that ends with the election of 1867. This was a contested election between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden. The vote ends up going to Congress. Congress agrees to give their vote to Rutherford B. Hayes in exchange for ending Reconstruction, in exchange for those troops leaving the South, the Northern troops leaving the South. And really it's this, at this point, we see kind of the cementing or the establishment of all of those Jim Crow laws or black codes and that organized racism throughout the South. And then it spreads finally at the end of the century in eight. 1896, we have a Supreme Court case called Plessy versus Ferguson. This is a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Homer Plessy was a man who was one eighth black who sat on a whites only train car in the state of Louisiana. And he did this on purpose. He wanted to protest the state train car law that separated whites and blacks. He was arrested and he argued that the state law violated his 14th Amendment, that equal protection clause that says you have to treat people equal under the law. The Supreme Court of the United States decision said that separate but equal is constitutional. This is so significant. 
because this ultimately legalizes segregation. It says you can separate the races as long as it's equal. You can have a whites only train car as long as you have a blacks only train car. You can have a whites only drinking fountain as long as you have a blacks only drinking fountain. You can have a white only wait waiting room as long as you have a black only waiting room. So as long as you have facilities for both races, you are allowed to separate them. And so this can spread segregation. It's no longer just those Southern state laws, those black codes or Jim Crow laws that are in certain states now, but now across the country, the Supreme Court of the United States has established segregation as law, saying that it is constitutional. It does not violate someone's constitutional rights. And this will hold for nearly over 50 years until 1954 with Brown versus Board of Education, but even that only addresses schools. And we'll talk more about that later. Thank you so much for listening today. If you have any questions, be sure to email me or visit me during office hours. Don't forget to review your notes at a later date, revise them, add your questions, and then ultimately summarize. Thank you so much and have a great day.